So a bunch of history YouTubers decided to make videos about the local history of the places they're from as a part of Project Homecoming 2, and I thought that would be fun. So if you enjoyed this video, there's a link to a playlist in the description where you can go check out other videos. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this video about the area I'm from, because it ended up being a land of one surprise after the other. Sometimes you learn some neat things, and I happen to have grown up in one of America's most unique yet almost overlooked regions, the Ozarks. Sprawled along where the edges of the Midwest and the South meet, the Ozarks is a small region near the center of the contiguous United States that spans across southern Missouri, northwestern Arkansas, the northeast corner of Oklahoma, and the tiniest bit of southeastern Kansas, although we typically pretend that that doesn't exist. It covers a series of plateaus in the Boston Mountains, giving it not only some elevation, but some gorgeous scenery. But in terms of the people living there, the Ozarks have a historical reputation of being seen as almost a land stuck behind in a simpler time. At least that's the nice way of putting it. More bluntly, the Ozarks are usually seen as the land of hillbillies. Yeah, sure, hillbillies can be found in any rural area in America like Appalachia or the Deep South, but the Ozarks were hillbilly central. As a kid, I remember watching old Looney Tunes cartoons on TV, and there was a specific episode called Hillbilly Hare, where Bugs Bunny would visit the Ozarks. He's enjoying the beautiful scenery until he runs into a pair of two barefoot, hairy, not-too-bright, straw-hat-wearing hillbillies with outdated rifles that are so long that Bugs could tie them into pretzel knots. Bugs Bunny disposed of them in typical Bugs Bunny fashion by using disguises and trickery, this time using a fiddle to play some mountain music and square dance the two hillbillies into hurting each other. Now, I certainly found this hilarious as a kid, and I still find it hilarious now, but this wasn't some episode where Bugs Bunny went back in time to the 1800s. The episode was set in the modern day, or at least when the episode came out in 1950. The fact that despite being set in 1950, you could easily confuse this for just after the American Civil War shows how America viewed the Ozarks from a pop culture perspective. The Ozarks were seen as the last bastion of the hillbilly days of old, but of course, like any regional stereotype, this was extremely exaggerated. Sure, hillbillies existed, but they were by no means what it meant to be Ozarkian, and yet the Ozarks in many ways embraced this culture anyway. We have old-timey American theme parks, we advertise our lands for their ideal hunting and fishing locations, you can literally see shows about hick families that are considered cultural bastions. But in spite of the Ozarks embracing this image, it was not because it was real. Ozarkian culture was actually created by America itself, and after decades of America insisting what the Ozarks were like, we kind of went along with it. The people living in these plateaus took their stereotypes and decided to co-opt the hillbilly image as an attempt of self-defensive pride. One of the best works on Ozarkian history is a three-volume series by historian Brooks Blevins called A History of the Ozarks. In the introduction of Volume 1, he sums it up perfectly. Whether our peculiarities are perceived or real, in the Ozarks we are no strangers to stereotype. We're accustomed to being labeled by outsiders. On occasion, we have co-opted a label and made it our own. Someone from rural south-central Missouri referring to himself as a hillbilly reflects a certain vigilant pride. That same man might be ready to fight if called a hillbilly by a Chicagoan. So how did a plateau of rural people acquire such a confused identity crisis? What about this random spot in middle America made them seem special from other parts of rural America to America at large? The answer lies in its chaotic history. While the Ozarks as a cultural region is a more modern concept, the physical region has always been there. As previously mentioned, there are several plateaus as well as the Boston Mountains in the area, and they're sometimes collectively labeled as the Ozarkian Plateau. As a result, there are a lot of springs, rivers, and caves in the region. It's because of these caves that we have one of the theories on the origin of the name Ozarks. One theory is that it comes from the French term au arcs, which means land of the arches as caves in the region would sometimes erode and collapse into natural bridges, which are rock formations that, well, look like garches. Before European arrival, the main indigenous group in the area were the Osage. While they didn't usually live in the plateaus of the Ozarks themselves, they did inhabit several areas in the region, using the local wood from Bodark trees to craft their bows, which is why they're called the French term for bow trees in the first place. However, their hold on the region would slip during colonial times. The French would claim the entire Mississippi River Basin as a part of their colony of Louisiana. 
Obviously, despite their claim, they did not fully control the region outside of coastal Louisiana. Otherwise, it was mostly trading posts along the many rivers that emanated from the Mississippi. However, the Osage would nevertheless slowly become dependent on trade with the French for their firearms and goods. But the ultimate weakening of their control of the region would be the arrival of other indigenous tribes that were being driven further west by early American expansion in the late 1700s and 1800s. Tribes such as the Shawnee, Delaware, Kickapoo, Miami, and bands of Cherokee would find themselves exiled to the Ozarks and the surrounding areas before eventually being pushed even further west in future decades. The beginning of the 19th century would see the first groups of white settlers move on to the Ozarkian Plateau itself thanks to the economic potential of mining. In 1797, a man named Moses Austin was given a land grant of 6,000 acres by Spanish authorities in what is today Washington County, Missouri. Within a few years, he had a very successful lead mining business in the Ozarks, producing over 4,500 tons of smelted lead within 20 years. Most of Austin's workers who would settle in the region for jobs at his lead mines were French Creole settlers, often not looked upon very kindly by Americans further east. Perhaps this is an early example of a sort of proto-hillbilly view of at least a large number of the people who lived there at the time. But ironically, the early 19th century of the Ozarks was demographically very diverse between the white settlers, Creole populations, and Native Americans, a much stark contrast to the late 19th century. The transition began as American expansion eventually made the Ozarks one of the gateways to the frontier further out west. As more indigenous groups were displaced and driven further west, more white American settlers out from the east moved in. Most of the new settlers were of Scots-Irish descent, who largely migrated to the Ozarks from Appalachia. The region was physically similar enough to Appalachia that it made the Ozarks a more appealing and familiar place to settle out west, to keep both the familiar comfort of home, but also have much better access to opportunities out west. There were also many German settlers as well. Blevins' book goes into a large historiographical argument about the transition of identifying as Scots-Irish to identifying as merely American, but regardless, the perception of the Ozarks being an Appalachia 2.0, mostly made up of Scots-Irish compared to other rural areas, definitely contributed to what would become the hillbilly stereotype. Thanks to the large amounts of discrimination many Scots-Irish Americans faced in early American history. By the 1850s, the Ozarkian Plateau and its valleys had been settled with several major towns. Aside from the lead mines, the economy had expanded to include timber, hunting, fishing, and a high amount of cattle driving. In terms of farming, there was a moderate amount of wheat and corn, but most of the region wasn't suitable for growing more intensive crops like cotton. This meant that while Missouri and Arkansas were slave states, the Ozarks had much fewer slaves compared to the rest of the states. Notably, Douglas County in Missouri was one of the few counties across the entire South that had zero slaves. Nevertheless, its proximity to the South meant that the Ozarks were a mixture of hicks, businessmen, workers, pro-slavery people, and abolitionists. Add to the fact that the Ozarks were seen as a gateway to the frontier, then it's no wonder there's no singular Ozarkian culture yet, in spite of some of the elements being there. During the American Civil War, Missouri's government was split, with one faction siding with the Union and the other siding with the Confederacy. A pro-Confederate militia named the Missouri State Guard often fought alongside invading Confederate forces against Union troops stationed in Missouri. As a result, the first major Civil War battle west of the Mississippi occurred in the Ozarks at a place called Wilson's Creek on August 10, 1861. Aside from Wilson's Creek, battles were fought at the places in the Ozarks like Boonville, Carthage, and Springfield in Missouri, as well as Pea Ridge and Prairie Grove in Arkansas. Despite the Union's eventual victory, the Ozarks would still face internal fighting. On July 21, 1865, Wild Bill Hickok conducted what many historians consider the first major shootout of the so-called Wild West by shooting Davis Tutt in Springfield, Missouri. This not only transformed Wild Bill Hickok into a folk hero, but also seemed to begin an era of vigilante violence in the Ozarks. Many former pro-Confederates turned to forming gangs, such as the famous Jesse James, and the rise of gang violence prompted many former Union soldiers to form a vigilante group called the Bald Knobbers. Years ago, I made a video about the Bald Knobbers, and I'll link it in the description if you want to learn more about them. But basically, they started off as a vigilante group to fight off gang violence, then slowly became corrupt themselves, and bullied the Ozarks. By 1889, the Bald Knobbers were gone with most of their leaders dead, but their infamy spread across the country. 
Similar to the Hatfields and McCoys, the activities of all these shootings, gangs, and vigilantes fascinated the American public, and suddenly the Ozarks were seen as this land of danger and excitement. In 1898, a man named Harold Bell Wright visited the Ozarks at the recommendation of his doctor, believing the region's climate would be good for him. After spending eight summers there, Wright decided in 1907 to publish a novel titled The Shepherd of the Hills, a tale set in the Ozarks. A mountain family in a small town called Branson, Missouri goes through emotional drama and even some ball knobber action. The book is a huge hit, making him the first millionaire author, and it also spawned multiple adaptations into stage plays and movies over the next several decades. The book is so popular that not only does it reinforce the image of hillbillies and old-timey American violence for the Ozarks, it actually starts the beginning of people visiting the real Branson, Missouri as a form of tourism. Then you have a man named Vance Randolph, a person who moved to the Ozarks from Kansas and became what is known as a folklorist. Basically, think of like a cultural historian where someone collects various tales, superstitions, and other folklore of a region. Vance Randolph, starting in the 1930s, began publishing works on Ozarkian folklore and took the idea of the Ozarks being backwoods mountain folk to a whole new level. His first book in 1931 was titled The Ozarks, an American survival of primitive society. You can kind of see how that might exaggerate and exoticize the reality of the Ozarks, even if it is based in some small amounts of truth. Despite all of these decades of American pop culture creating Ozarkian culture, the reality was not matching the fantasy. The region was still not unified as you had sharp divisions between Southwest Missouri being heavily Republican and in favor of increasing educational reforms, and Southeast Missouri being heavily Democrat and still reliant on the mining economy. Then the advent of the railroad brought new divisions where areas with the railroad began experiencing more economic prosperity, while areas without the railroad would grow increasingly poor and experience some of the worst poverty in the entire country. There would also unfortunately be some racial tensions, as there were several mass lynchings in the region against the African American population in the early 20th century. While this was sadly a common thing across most of the American South, it still left a notably stark contrast to the more lovely exotic view America had for the Ozarks. By the middle of the 20th century, the Ozarks had begun to finally see themselves as a thing. With tourism growing in the post-war economy, they began to advertise themselves to take advantage of the hillbilly image. For a short time, Springfield, Missouri became the capital of country music before Nashville ever did, and they decided to host a nationwide TV series called the Ozark Jubilee, which featured many prominent country stars. Then a spin-off show called the Five Star Jubilee became the first network color television series outside of either New York City or Hollywood. This would soon begin a pattern of the Ozarks trying to present themselves as the tourist destination for Middle America, as an alternative to Hollywood or New York. With the advent of the highway system, the Ozarks would find themselves once again a sort of frontier as one of the major stops on Route 66 going from Chicago to LA. Perhaps the ultimate height of Ozarkian notoriety was the 1962 through 1971 TV program The Beverly Hillbillies, about a hillbilly family from the Ozarks that got to move to Beverly Hills and hijinks ensued. This would all increase tourism to the region both for visiting Branson's hillbilly legacy and for visiting the beautiful wildlife to hunt and fish. Popularity of hunting and fishing in the Ozarks notably led to the rise of Bass Pro Shops in the 1970s. Branson, Missouri, meanwhile, becomes essentially the Vegas of the Ozarks, but less gambling and more old-timey American imagery. Music stars and comedians ranging from Andy Williams to Yakov Smirnov would open shows in Branson like a Vegas Regency. Then, of course, you could also see a production of Shepherd of the Hills or visit Silver Dollar City Theme Park, basically Hillbilly Disney World. The tourism drive to Branson was so insane that the airport in Springfield, Missouri, just 45 minutes north of Branson, changed its name to Springfield Branson Airport in 1992 just to encourage people to land there. Of course, by this point, you kind of see the irony, right? We have a region that America popularized as this backwards backwoods of trigger-happy mountain folk, and yet they've capitalized on the idea to the point of being one of the forefronts of music, television, and tourism. The identity America gave the Ozarks is one of exaggeration and fantasy, and yet it came true because, hey, business is business, right? The Ozarks were basically an identity crisis of a culture that eventually gave in to the hype. I'm Emperor Tigerstar, and I'll see you guys next time.